Welcome, everybody. My name's uh, Elaine Ikeda. I am the executive director of LEAD California and one of the co-editors on this book. Uh, I'm just going to do some housekeeping uh, and um, a little bit of an introduction while we continue to let folks fill the room. We're thrilled that 99 people or around 99, 100, maybe we had 100 people signed up to um, participate in this. And we are recording. So if you have to leave early um, or you know you want to share this with someone else, everyone who registered will receive a uh, an email in a few days with the recording. Uh, I highly recommend that you put your uh, your screen on speaker view because we will be hearing from all the different chapter authors and um, it'll be easier for you to um, see this, the main speaker if you have it on speaker view. And, um, and so I'm gonna just say a little bit about our agenda, uh, the, the flow of the, the hour and a half that we have together. And then um, we'll get going and we'll actually take down the slide so that you can um, see the people speaking. Um, so as I said, I'm Elaine Ikeda, she, her pronouns. I am the executive director of LEAD California. And we are a coalition of college presidents in California who are committed to engaging students in community and uh, civic and community engagement, service learning, experiential education um, opportunities while they're in college. Um, so we work with about 40 colleges throughout California. Uh, and then we're also connected uh, to other um, organizations in the Western region and nationally, so that we do also have a national presence uh, you may be familiar with some of our other programs, such as Dissertation Dish, and right now we're doing a series on promotion and tenure. All of that is up on our website. Um, you can access our recordings there. Um, again, if you put yourself on speaker view, that would be great. And um, so basically what we're going to do is we're actually going to just walk through uh, the book and um, we're honored to have so many of our chapter authors with us. I'm honored to have our co-editors here with us as well. And I'll say a word in just a moment about them. Um, and then when we get to the end, um, we will have time for Q&A for anyone who wants to stay on and have a perhaps less formal interaction with the authors. Um, and so for now, I'd appreciate it if everyone does stay on mute um, as we go through this. Um, Piper, you can go ahead and take down this uh, frame. And um, so uh, let me begin by saying first, a thank you to my co-editors, Dr. Elena Claw and Andrea Tully from San Jose State University for uh, inviting me to be a part of this book project. And I also wanna thank uh, John Van Noring who uh, was with Stylus until they um, got, uh, he decided he needed to, wanted to retire. Uh, and so Rutledge took over the Stylus publications. So we got caught a little bit in the middle of that transition, but um, really, really grateful to John for, for um, looking at our proposal and deciding that we all collectively had something um, valuable to contribute to um, this, this, um, this field. Uh, and I also wanna thank all the authors that said yes to our invitation to be part of this book. We are so honored to have you as um, part of the book with us. I um, am going to turn it over briefly to Dr. Elena Claw and Andrew Tully, both to introduce themselves and also to talk a little bit about how the book came to be. So um, uh, Elena or Andrea, whoever would like to go first. Yes. Oh, you're muted.
sorry, I just joined, but I thought I heard my name. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I'm talking about Andrea Tully, the author, oh. the editor. So <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and Elena, are you able to unmute? Not sure what's happening. Andrea, maybe you can- Well, I'll go ahead and introduce myself and hopefully we get that tech glitch figured out. My name is Andrea Tully. I'm the assistant director of the Center for Community Learning and Leadership at San Jose State University. I am a community engagement professional. I am a staff member. And I say that because um, a lot of the literature is authored by people with doctoral degrees. And from my understanding, it's very rare to have professional staff members um, uh, be an editor and have authorship in community engagement, higher education and literature, and I'll say more about that later. But I just really want to take a minute to acknowledge Elena and Elaine, because they both have been so pivotal in my professional career. So to have my name sandwiched between theirs on a book is probably one of the honors of my career, truly. So with that, I'll say more later, but hopefully Elena, who is the lead editor on this book, and I'm hard launching into this. Uh, this is literally my first gig back from maternity leave. Um, I left when we were editing the index, and she really has been at the helm spearheading this. So I hopefully can turn it over to her. Okay, um, we're going to try um, uh, one thing is I'm going to see if Piper can also unmute you, perhaps, um, as as one of the hosts. But um, and um, as I said before, if you want to put yourself your screen on speaker view so that you can see mostly the person who's speaking, um, I'm going to just say a little bit then about um, uh and Elena, hopefully I do you justice, but um, Elena has been a long time um, faculty member at San Jose State University and leading the efforts there um, for many years uh, of what's happening at San Jose State around community engagement uh, and has is a well-established author in her own field. Um, and um, so she had a sabbatical coming up, but she and um, Andrea had been engaged in a lot of research around some of the work they were doing at San Jose State. And so they had been talking about getting that out to a wider audience. Uh, and then they were kind enough to invite me to be a part of the conversation. We were um, recognizing that we were coming out of COVID a little bit and people were beginning to come back to campus or at least um, anyway, but we were thinking partly about, you know, how is higher education changing and um, with COVID and, and all the racial reckoning that was going on across the country. Um, and, uh, and also during that time, um, colleagues in LEAD California's membership had gotten together to write a statement about our time, um, and that is up on our website as well. Um, and so there were several different touch points probably that inspired us to collaborate together um, to um, work on this book and reach out to uh, a number of folks that we knew and some that we even didn't know um, in our network. Um, I, in particular, wanted to make sure we were highlighting some voices that perhaps hadn't been heard as much. Um, some of these folks had recently completed their doctoral dissertations and had really um, outstanding new information to share. Many have been working on their campuses for a number of years, but haven't been able to get out on the national conference circuit, you know, get around and do all the presentations. So I'm really thrilled that we were able to highlight what I thought um, were perhaps some really um, unheard voices that needed to be heard more loudly. Um, 
I think it's important to also, uh, Andrea mentioned this, the blending of voices that we wanted to have faculty as a part of this bo book, administrators, staff members, and um, also even an, a government um, uh, representative. So, um, and then another intentionality that we had around this book was we asked the authors to all share um, a bit about themselves and their journey. And so to situate themselves personally, um, which you don't always see in books, but we thought it was an important um, to hear their stories and, and have an understanding of how that might've helped influence them in the experiences they're having. Um, and then the other thing that we wanted to have as part of this, if at all it worked out, and it and it did, was to have some tools in there and models um, for action that other people could take away from the chapter, and um, and uh, you know, perhaps stimulate um, some replication or at least stimulate ideas of other models of things happening on campus. Um, it looks like Elena is still not back. Hmm. So um, I am gonna move us along uh, into our, so the book is divided into three sections and um, I'm going to actually, um, uh, Elena and Andrea really, I didn't have much to do with this first introductory chapter. They carried a lot of the load on on much of the writing uh, in, in our book, on our section. So um, Andrea, is there anything you wanted to say more uh, related to the intro? Or if you're comfortable, we can start moving right into the chapters. Let's, let's move into the chapters. I know Elena's restarting right now because I really want to let her have a moment she took the lead on that. So I want her to be able to talk about it. Yeah. And we can yeah. definitely, yeah. When she's able to reconnect, um, we can take a pause, but, um, our first section, the part one is enacting social justice, um, current context and community engagement. And we're honored to have with us Glenn Bowman, uh, I'm sorry, Glenn Bowen. Uh, Glenn, if you can unmute and introduce yourself to everyone and talk a little bit about your chapter. Uh, thank you, Elaine. Hello, everyone. My name is Glenn Bowen. I'm the executive director of the Center for Community Service Initiatives, the CCSI, at Barry University in Miami, Florida. My work involves the development implementation and maintenance of programs and events that have made Barry University a Carnegie classified community engaged institution. Community engagement strategies for responding to socio-political and racial challenges facing American society and higher education. That's the title of chapter two of the book being formally introduced during this webinar. My co-authors, Courtney Berrien and Ronnie Bennett and I are delighted to make a contribution, a modest contribution, mind you, to an excellent volume, a volume that presents a research-informed reframing of community engagement in higher education. Courtney is a Barry University colleague. Ronnie is a community partner with South Florida people of color. Social injustice, political strife and systemic racism are plaguing American society. Although these issues are intractable, they are amenable to social change. Indeed, they can be addressed effectively through community engagement, through reciprocal collaboration between higher education institutions and stakeholders in their larger communities, locally, regionally, nationally. What's required is a comprehensive approach, an approach that encompasses various strategies, 
from discussions of books and films to truth-telling and racial healing initiatives. From civic learning and democratic engagement projects to social justice-oriented service learning. From anti-racist educational workshops to the decolonization of the curriculum. A successful approach is decidedly anti-racist. After all, as the influential scholar Angela Davis declared, and I quote, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist, end quote. Finally, even though the community engagement strategies discussed in the chapter will not solve the socio-political and racial problems affecting our society and higher education, they can contribute to lasting social change. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, our, our chapter three uh, author is unable to be with us. That is Dr. Star Plaxton Moore. From, uh, she is the Director of Community Engaged Learning at the University of San Francisco. Uh, and, um, and her chapter, uh, the title is Mapping Our Capacities to Facilitate Change, Applying the Ecosystem of Critical Feminist Praxis for Community Engaged Professionals. Um, and um, so I'll just say a brief word about her chapter. I highly recommend you reading it. I served on her dissertation committee and uh, it's just, this chapter is just, uh, is based on some of that research. Um, and she provides a much needed feminist perspective and helps us rethink the founding stories of service and community engaged learning, providing a valuable corrective about the role that civil rights activists and advocates of ethnic, ethnic studies have played. So I found her chapter to be very refreshing and new um, and providing a lot of great um, philosophical and, um, and insightful um, reflections on where our uh, field has been and some reinterpreting of some of that. Um, Next, after that, I want to introduce um, Patty Robinson and invite her to unmute and talk about chapter four. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, this is a real pleasure to be working uh, in the, the, the presence of such great folks and uh, coming from a community college. It's, it's a special honor. Um, the chapter that uh, myself and my co-author, Virtus Robinson, who is not able to be here today, uh, is entitled Reclaiming the Mission of the Community College, Civic Community and Political Engagement Reimagined. Um, my role or who I am, I am the faculty director of civic and community engagement at College of the Canyons. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Um, we are a community college located in North Los Angeles County. Um, at the same time, um, we have a very large and diverse population, obviously being in Southern California. Uh, I have worked as a sociology instructor, department chair, a uh, division dean, and I've gone back to working as a faculty director as a way to move forward civic and community engagement on our campus. Um, Virtus is now the interim president of the National Issues Forum uh, Institute, or what is known as NIFI. Um, again, just to give you a little bit about my background, I've been at COC for 25 and a half years. Um, and I began our civic engagement initiative in 2015, resulting from a Bringing Theory to Practice grant. In this role, I work to advance civic and democratic uh, engagement throughout our campus to really create a mindset of, of this work. Um, and this may sound odd to many of you because you do this on your campuses, but this is not typical for community colleges, particularly in California. Um, at the same time, I uh, organize workshops, activities, presentations, guest speakers, and because of bringing theory to practice and my relationship with several other colleagues at other campuses, we've created civic dialogues. Um, we brought some of the most well-known national speakers to this forum, uh, and we're now going into our fourth year. I also lead um, action 
teams. I am the person who works with um, the voting aspect of AB 963 on our campus. And I was also the lead and co-author of our recent Carnegie application, um, which we actually uh, just received. And we were the only community college to actually even submit an application in California, which is, again, part of why this work is so important, given that we have 116 community colleges. So the purpose of our article was really to reimagine the idea of civic learning and democratic engagement and to include the idea of going back to the Truman Report of 1947 and get community colleges, particularly not only across the country, but in California, to think in terms of how they are democracy's colleges, how the civic mission needs to be reimagined and re-implemented and refocused in uh, the context of the work that we do in community colleges. Um, one of the ways that we have framed this is that we've talked about it with regard to civic equity. Um, we have a lot of emphasis, obviously, on uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, but we never talk about it from the standpoint of civic equity. And given the fact there are over a thousand community colleges in the nation, we have 116 in California, we serve 100, or excuse me, 1.9 million students, that equity gap is huge, particularly when we talk about the civic equity gap. Um, what makes this so important is that this is a wonderful place for us as a system to actually think in terms of, of having the most diverse population of students throughout the country, how we can actually get them involved in this work. Um, at the same time, it's important to connect this to the growing initiatives that we see, um, Guided Pathways, DEI, and also certainly within California, as well as across the country, workforce development. Unfortunately, many of these initiatives are, are very much divided, and we don't typically think in terms of connecting or uh, bringing in um, civic learning and democratic engagement into this work, and this is one of the things that Virtus and I really argue for. Um, at the same time, what we also discussed in the chapter is how we need to flip the script, and I know this happens much more in, in four-year colleges than it does in community colleges, but we really are trying to emphasize the need to go back and integrate those civic high impact practices like dialogue, applied learning, and the other kinds of things that are oftentimes found much more accessible on four-year campuses and start to have this be ha happening system-wide, um, if not nationwide. And one of the things that we really emphasized in the article was the need to move to project-based learning, um, moving the idea of hours of service to impacts for change. And by doing this, creating real world, uh, having our students engage in problem solving, um, looking at this real world wicked problems and actually not just providing the service, which is so important, but to also think in terms of creating change through real solutions. Um, and also, just finally, um, I provide examples from College of the Canyons that we have been engaged in um, over the last decade, well, actually about nine years, excuse me, um, that we have been in, uh, working on. So that's kind of our article in a, in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, it looks like our next author is not on um, the call with us right now, so I'll just say a brief word um, about uh, the chapter, our fifth chapter, social media and youth climate activism, community engaged learning for the 2020s with Ellen Mid Mida, Mark Felton and Henry Fan. Um, and um, so this chapter, Ellen and her colleagues provide perspective on how online platforms can be generative spaces for building critical inquiry and productive political discourse through deliberative dialogue. Um, one of the things that I was grateful that we had someone like Ellen and her colleagues is, you know, to, to be able to talk a little bit about using social media. It's such a big part of our world. And um, I was really thrilled that we had a chapter in our book that addressed a little bit of the possible ways you could effectively use social media in the classroom and with students. Um, so uh, one of the things that I wanna just say coming out of this first section of the book, uh, what you might've noticed is that we asked um, folks who represented very diverse campuses. That was definitely a goal that Andrea, Elena and I had um, of highlighting you know, state land grant universities, um, research universities, but also community colleges, rural, urban, 
Um, we try to um, identify authors from across the country. Um, so uh, hopefully you picked that up in the first section. It, it permeates through the entire book. Um, and so before we move into part two of the book, I want to, since we have a couple minutes, I'd like to see if Elena, who is back and yeah. can unmute and you can say a little bit going back to sort of, you know, how you came to be a part of the book and inspired the book. And um, anyway, you have a few minutes. First of all, I'm so sorry. It's literally like I was caught in a nightmare, you know, like that nightmare that you're, you can't move from my screen was frozen and I couldn't do anything about it. So there it was. Okay. And we, and we all survived. So sorry again. Right. Uh, my name is Elena Claw. I am a professor of psychology at San Jose State and the director of the Center for Community Learning and Leadership. Um, Andrew and I have worked closely together for what is it, seven years, and I have been at the university for 24 years at San Jose State. Um, so I've seen a lot of transitions both in the field and the way we talk about service learning slash community engaged learning. And initially, Andrew and I were thinking we were conducting lots of research and scholarship about the effects of service learning, the effects of community engaged learning on alumni careers, particularly the effects of our AmeriCorps programs, which we'll talk about later, but are now called College Corps programs, and really seeing the impact on the kinds of things that matter, that matter to students and that matter to the university and that we believe create civically engaged people who can participate effectively and critically in a democratic society. So I believed that sort of back in the 90s when my PhD process was to get a PhD in clinical and community psychology, and I believe it even more strongly now. So we were doing that work and Andrea, I think Elaine started saying, pointed me to the wonderful work that Elaine was doing and how she had written an article on the urgency and necessity of community engagement for higher education. And I literally said, yes, that's it. That's what we're all doing. And so we came together and we collectively survived a pandemic. We survived the acquisition of Stylus by Rutledge. It was a little little hairy, a little stressful. We, right, I came back from my one semester sabbatical. Note, any faculty, a book takes four years, not one semester, right? <laughs> we came back, we came together, and we put out work that hopefully is meaningful, purposeful, and inspires, educates, and guides people in the community engagement field. So it's our hope that we can continue this momentum and coming together, celebrating, discussing, moving the field forward because the world needs us. And I, I have to tell myself every day, honestly, that we can't give up hope, right? We don't have the luxury of despair. So all of you are working on a pedagogy of hope and I am honored to work with each of you. Thank you, Elena. I'm so glad we could get your voice and your perspective. You. Um, <laughs> and we'll hear more from her in just a uh, in just a moment. Um, our part two of the book uh, is called "Building a Movement: Establishing Infrastructure for Community Engagement." Um, and so I uh, did write a chapter. Um, uh, for this section of the book called Coalition Building for Transformation and Change in Higher Education. And um, it was, I de decided to divide um, the chapter into two parts. Part of what I do is go visit campuses and, and in many ways, um, uh, listen to what's going on on campus and help them strategize on how to embed community engagement uh, across the uh, campus. Um, and so I just decided to take a lot of the different questions and um, assessments that were 
done on these visits over the years and uh, include them in the chapter as ways that folks could think about how do you institutionalize this work on a campus? How do you make change happen? How do you influence faculty, administrators, students? Um, and, and how do you work with the community? So obviously I did not cover it all because there's, there's books and books on how to institutionalize and assess service learning and community engagement in higher education. So um, there's lots of gaps, but um, the other part of the chapter uh, that I wanted to focus on is that there are a ton of organizations, national, regional, local, um, that really are exist to help campuses uh, and, um, and the field move forward in this work. And so part of the second, the second part of the chapter is about how do you build coalitions um, in different ways. And um, really the focus, as all of you probably know, is really on the relationship building that happens and being able to work with trust with each other to move things forward. So, um, so that's uh, chapter six. Um, we had invited um, Josh Friday to be with us. It does not look to me, if if Josh, if you're on, please unmute yourself. But otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Elena and Andrea to talk about Chapter Seven. As... Yeah, we're having our own whole situation here now that uh, <laughs> whoops, now that Josh isn't on. So we are we were really hoping that the Chief of Service would talk about how this is an initiative that came from a major effort by Gavin Newsom to develop program, AmeriCorps programs out of the state of California to a program that is now bigger than the entire Peace Corps. So we are really, really proud of being part of domestic service programs that build infrastructure. And our, since I'm talking, I guess, I'm a faculty, I'll keep talking for a minute. Just tell me when to stop because I'm a faculty, I'll keep talking. So it, so we, as the Center for Community Learning and Leadership, used to be Center for Service Learning, have been involved with AmeriCorps programs and California volunteers since the very inception of the center in 2000 with Dr. Deborah David. So she started the program with an AmeriCorps grant. What's changed since Gavin Newsom's initiative is that students now earn a living wage and the program as it stands called College Corps is supposed to provide a debt-free passage through college. Now, in California, we know that $10,000 a year does not leave a student debt-free, but it's certainly much better I'm than- Can inter interrupt you really quick? Yeah. Just, you know, Josh just got on the call. So oh. if you- Okay. Want to wrap up what you're talking about and then turn it over to John? But, you know, I'm giving your spiel, Josh, about a debt a debt free passage through college and compared to the prior AmeriCorps effort where students earn $2 an hour and yet participated in over 450 hours of service per year, we've come an enormous way in transforming the value, the meaning, and the sort of reimbursement for doing service such that we create future- right. No, nothing. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Josh Friday, Chief of Service for the state of California. So goes, and talking about, and so goes the nation. That's our chapter. That's, that's exactly right. And we're so grateful uh, for, for this book, for this effort, uh, and this really this movement around how do we tie uh, national service to uh, uh, higher education in a really big way. And uh, as you said, uh, the work that we've done together with the governor and California volunteers and San Jose State uh, is leading the nation in a big way. I'll just give the punchline, which is uh, last uh, a couple of weeks ago, last month, the governor of New York uh, just announced that they're creating the Empire State Corps, which is based off of the California College Corps model. And the College Corps, of course, is what we discuss in this book. Uh, that came from a pilot that started with um, with San Jose State uh, and now has then spread to 46 campuses across the whole state. And the idea is really quite simple, like a California GI Bill, and I'm a veteran, so it's easy for me to think about it that way. Uh, like a GI Bill, we do provide, as was just mentioned, debt-free pathways for students who are willing to step up and serve. And, and what we've seen is, is that 
this kind of program, this kind of model where we where we connect uh, helping students pay for school with having them serve in the community is really a win win win. It's a it ends up being a win for the for the student when we help them pay for school, graduate with less debt, which of course helps them for the rest of their life. But, but while they're going through the experience, they're, they're building social networks, they're building social capital, they're making connections, they're building skills that are really important and valuable uh, in the workplace as we see more and more of the skills around uh, learning how to work in teams, learning how to uh, build relationships, learning how to adapt. These are all the skills that these students are learning. So it's a win for them. Uh, it's also a win for the community. Last year, our first cohort of College Corps, which of course San Jose State was a major player in, um, had over 1.1 million hours of service uh, across the state of California. So just think about the impact of that, the impact in our schools where they're tutoring and mentoring, uh, they were, they're teaching uh, students how to code uh, and also helping them uh, deal with learning loss coming out of COVID. But they're also helping in our, in our food banks uh, and, and supporting food insecurity. And they're helping take climate action across the state, everything from urban forestry to urban greening to fire prevention. So they're doing really meaningful work that's a win for the community. And then, of course, uh, and perhaps most importantly, it's a win for all of society and all of us. Because now, through these kinds of programs and College Corps, we are creating a new generation of young people who are hopefully inspired to go into national service, but also have the tools to actually solve problems, to work with people of very different backgrounds and perspectives, to be able to solve the biggest challenges facing us as a society. And our hope is that with these tools, that they're going to show there's a new way that we can move beyond the divisive politics that we're also familiar with. And where I think we're also sick of uh, to, to a new way where we can actually solve problems together in communities where we take care of each other. So we're so proud of, of this program. We're so proud that it has its roots with San Jose State. And we're so proud that we get to be part of this really, really cool movement and book around the role that higher education, which we think is critical, plays in service across the country. So thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's just, I feel very lucky to be part of this, uh, part of this movement. Uh, and I'm excited that we, we're just getting started. Thanks for squeezing us in while you're at the airport. We really appreciate you. And apologize <laughs> for all the noise. No, there's no noise. Thank you. Andrea and Elena, I'll turn it back over to you to talk a little bit more about the rest of the chapter. Andrew, sure. I just I just want to say um, more on the boots on the ground perspective that this program has not been easy, ah. but it is uh, <laughs> understatement of the year, Elena. It is absolutely worth it. We at San Jose State, like Josh said, we were a pilot campus back in 2020. We um, launched on time in the middle of the pandemic with remote service. We didn't know naively that it was an option to delay. Um, so since then, <laughs> and and we to make um, it harder on ourselves, we decided to do research on this cohort. Um, so since then we've had 223 fellows participate, um, well over 100,000 hours of service, hundreds, hundreds of children in our community who have been impacted, who would not have had a mentor necessarily or mentors in this volume from San Jose State University. We're extremely proud because of the nature of our program that oh, we have students from all of our nine colleges, from art majors to business, to science, to engineering. Um, and also that the diversity of our cohort represents the diversity of our community. Um, so I just, it's been a lot and I'm really excited to actually get back in the office for maternity leave to see our fellows because they really, truly make showing up at the office so much more fun. Thanks so much. Elena, any last words or can I go ahead and move? Just to Josh's signature phrase. And I, I think it's Gavin Newsom's as well is the chapter ends with let's get to work. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I think that's a really unique part of our book that we have uh, that chapter in there highlighting the government's role also, um, the leadership in, in California. And as he said, it's now, you know, starting to influence other states as well. Um, 
I am now going to invite um, Erica Yamamura to unmute and introduce herself and her co-authors. Um, I'm really thrilled we were able to have a presidential perspective as part of our book. So our Erica, take it away. Thank you, Elaine. Um, good morning. My name is Erica Yamamura. I use she, her pronouns. Um, currently, I serve as Associate Director for Strategic Initiatives at the UCLA Center for Community Engagement. In my role, I support institutionalization of community engagement into our strategic plan where um, we are fortunate that goal one is to enhance community engagement at UCLA by deepening our engagement with Los Angeles. Um, I'm also excited to share we just launched a $2 million internal grant competition for social impact collaboratives to incubate community engaged research projects that are interdisciplinary in LA city and county. Um, as Elaine mentioned earlier, you know, we were invited to um, propose a chapter. And one of the things I really appreciated about this process is integrating my education and professional life. Um, I'm one of the beneficiaries of a lot of the great work that was done in the 80s and 90s. Uh, my entry to community engagement began as an undergrad student at UCLA where I signed up for as many service learning classes as possible. And my guess is for many of you, um, that might be a, a similar experience. Um, as a doc student, I had the privilege of working with Sandy Aston on the long-term impact of service learning. So this is 10 years after college, which got me excited about research. Um, and most recently while working on this research, I was a professor at Seattle U for 12 years where I collaborated with our community engagement office as a faculty member. So I, I am a recent transplant to the administrative side um, and I'm very much enjoying it. I wanted to take a moment to recognize my co-authors, Kent Cope, the executive director of the Sunboard Center for Community Engagement at UCLA, or sorry, at Seattle U. Um, and also Chris Nivey, the Associate Vice President for Community Engagement and Anchor Initiatives at the University of San Diego. This chapter is an outgrowth of Kent and I's book um, on place-based engagement in higher ed, a strategy to transform universities and communities, where we posited a place-based community engagement framework with a geographic focus, one that has equal emphasis on campus and community engagement, um, a long-term vision and commitment, and university-wide engagement that animates the mission and develops the institution. Um, and like many initiatives, we also draw upon the concept of collective impact. Um, in this book, we also identified three phases of place-based engagement, um, including exploratory development and sustaining. So we completed that book in 2018 and post book we went into deeper analysis of our of the data of our five campuses and, and two areas really emerged. Um, one that leadership practices facilitate place based community engagement and we published uh, in the Journal of Higher Education Outreach and Engagement in 2019. And then when this chapter opportunity became available, we dug even deeper. So this chapter focuses on presidential leadership um, or chapter eight. And in particular, we focus um, our analysis on two faith-based um, institutions. And so our research questions for this chapter was really, what does presidential leadership look like in highly community engaged faith-based institutions? Um, and in a nod to the to the era of the time, um, in times of crisis, how do presidents support community engagement? So we focused our analysis on two of the most seasoned college presidents um, of the five campuses that we had originally studied um, at Seattle U and the University of San Diego. Um, and these presidents have more than um, five years of experience as president. So at the time of publication, um, Father Sunborg was the longest serving Jesuit president um, of all the Jesuit institutions. Um, and Jim Harris had been at the University of San Diego for five years. And he had previously served as a president at Widener for 13 years and Defiance College for eight years. So we really got a um, keen perspective on 
college presidents who are not new necessarily to their institution and who have also been long serving as college presidents. Um, in our chapter, we highlight three key themes, um, community engagement as a way to actualize missions. So both of the presidents really talked about how mission is not just a statement, but it's really a verb as part of their leadership platform. Um, another key theme was the importance of presidential leadership, um, both personally as white male presidents um, in this time where diversity, equity, and inclusion were becoming um, more central and how they led um, through their identity and when they would step up and step back. And then finally, um, another key theme was the link between community engagement and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and in particular, what we found fascinating is the presidents really reflected on as student demographics become more diverse and the presidents at faith based become more lay, um, the purpose of the university and the way in which presidents lead also changed. So we are still in this environment where you're seeing the layification of faith based institutional presidencies, um, and it'll be interesting to see how that continues to pan out. So I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Elaine. Thanks, Erica. Um, I, yeah, so again, back to that diversity, we tried to have, um, I, I was thrilled we were able to have, uh, you know, the faith-based institutions represented to, in our book as well. Um, so part three of the book, uh, Reconceptualizing Roles, Faculty, Staff, and Partnerships in Community Engagement. So here in this section, we're going to delve deep into the different um, folks on campus that are part of this community engagement work. And chapter nine, uh, Andrea mentioned this a little bit in her introduction, um, but she uh, gathered together a number of community engagement professionals. So Andrea, I'm going to turn it over to you and to some of your other colleagues who are on the call with you. Thank you, Elaine. So community engagement professionals and transformational education is um, was authored by myself as well as Pilar Pacheco, a long term uh, community engagement director at CSU Channel Islands. Andrea Tofoya, who at the time was a community par partner coordinator at UC Merced, I believe she's recently or more recently become promoted. And Bryant Fairley, who was also at a CSU at the time, I'll let him say where he is now um, in a minute. And then Daniel Fidago Tomei, who has a doctoral degree, but intentionally stepped back from a managerial role into more of a community um, partner, a coordinator position intentionally, because that's the work he wanted to do. So the, the basis of this chapter is that there's a plethora of literature about the infrastructure of community engagement in higher education, as well as about community engaged faculty, students, community partners, in the field, there's far less literature about community engagement professionals. Lena Distilio really has led some efforts around that and I know is, um, I believe, leading a campus compact survey uh, for community engaged professionals now. Um, but there's far less about community engaged professionals, um, which are defined as professional staff members. And even less is written by CEPs about themselves. So I would actually challenge Campus Compact to perhaps invite community engaged professionals themselves to be authors of this work in addition to surveying us. Um, but as a CPE, a CEP myself, who had the opportunity to work alongside a faculty member and a nonprofit administrator to edit this tome, um, it was important to me that first person perspectives were included for my fellow CEPs, as I said. Um, my hope is that readers are able to connect with the perspectives shared um, by the CEPs and are buoyed by the common themes. Um, so I'll share the common themes uh, briefly. Um, first is that social responsibility was cultivated at a very young age 
and provided motivation for the pursuit of this field as a career. Um, it also motivates CEPs to address inequities they see and um, recognize varied stakeholders as equals. Um, mentorship within and outside of the community engagement field plays a pivoted role in you know, cultivating CEPs who push higher education towards social change. Um, CPEs developed expertise in empowering others to work creatively and collaboratively to address inequities. And also, this was a big one for me because this not, CEPs don't often, in amongst ourselves, we'll say these things, but not also not often as publicly to faculty and administrators. The CEPs recognize and illuminate insta instances in which institutional rhetoric does not match the resources and structures required to implement reciprocal reciprocal community engagement efforts. Uh, we don't we don't often because of the nature of our roles have uh, the capacity to speak that truth um, to those who have more of the power usually on university campuses. Um, and also CEPs serve as models of reflexive practice. They embody the importance of self-inquiry, commitment to learning, and our fundamental responsibility to serve. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Bryant to say more about his experience. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you all today. And so as Andrea mentioned previously, I served as the associate director at Cal State San Bernardino, and then as the director at Cal Poly Pomona for their centers of community engagement up until September of this year. And so it was wonderful for me to be able to uh, connect and learn and grow um, my experience, of course, in California. And then... Um, take some of those same things and then have them, of course, apply to my new role at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. And so it was wonderful for me to be able to reflect on the why I got involved in this work uh, and then also sort of in recognition of the fact that in many respects, there are not many men that are in this work. And then also there are not as many black men that are in this work as well. And so um, I think my story really talks about the the way in which public service um, was a, a ethos throughout um, my my family and throughout sort of how I grew up and how um, the values that are instilled in me and then also it my story talks a little bit about sort of that that value change and when the values didn't match what I the the mission then it felt for me an opportunity for me to find a place where my values. Um, also match with the mission. And I think that's a real key ingredient for this work and the role that we play as community engagement professionals is that we have the opportunity to live out our values every day uh, and really be able to um, help other students to explore their values, to define their passions, and be also able to see themselves and belonging at the university and the community. And when I, again, uh, reflect on my own experience as a, a freshman at Cal State Fullerton, it was that very first connection to service that allowed me to see myself in this way. Um, and I'm really thankful for my parents for not being dream killers in so many respects. When I shifted from what my initial dream was going to be for my career in public service, which was the military and being a, a top gun pilot, uh, I because um, that movie was everything and the remake was also everything, um, I shifted pretty quickly to wanting to be mayor. And my parents, um, I'm not a first generation student. My, uh, they didn't laugh at me. They didn't, they didn't sort of rush me out the room and say, Brian, you've got to shift and refocus your goals about what you want to do as a career. They let me painfully discover that uh, mayors have a whole career before they come mayor, before they become mayor. And so it's always been my own little inside joke with my family about sort of what I want to do and the discovery that comes along from that 
the discovery that comes along from really figuring out who you are and having the space and place to do so. And so I think what you find in our chapter is people discovering who they are, discovering what their worth is and how their worth is connected to the university and the role that we play in helping students to also discover who they are and live their values out in practice as well. So it was a pleasure to be a part of it. Um, I really hope that there are other folks that can share their voices to this chapter as well. But um, I think that for me personally, it was really helpful as I really not only examine what I currently do, but also um, the, the role of the work and how that work is such a fabric of who I am as a person, not just what I do, that it created this whole sort of um, existential crisis when I thought about what I was going to be doing next. And so it was it was really powerful and really wonderful um, from a, um, a real internal perspective to be part of this experience. So thank you again. Thanks so much. Andrea, anything, any last words that you want no, to say? I think that's great. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Um, so the next chapter is chapter 10, the tensions and rewards of community engagement for faculty members. So I'm going to turn it back over to Elena so she can talk about it and introduce her colleagues. Absolutely. So again, Elena Claw, she, her, and I wrote this chapter with a bunch of faculty who I would say often do not speak about their own experiences because we're told to always be, at least in my field, in many fields, objective and scientific and to separate sort of the, the personal from what is operationalized. And those of us who do feminist, qualitative and community-based action research feel passionately about breaking that divide. So the chapter is co-authored with colleagues on to know, Dr. on to know, Dr. Angie Mejia and Dr. Marie Sandy, who is here and will speak and Dr. John Levinson. So as Elaine indicated, it was really important to us to um, include authors from different kinds of institutions. So here we have selective faith-based uh, Brandeis University, as well as tier one research universities and our own San Jose State, which is a public comprehensive commuter university in an urban setting. We also, for this chapter, wanted to access faculty who are, are in different positions um, in terms of the way they serve the university from lecturer to tenure track, to full professors involved in leadership positions. So we are able to access also perspectives from different disciplines. So that was really important to us. So I will give our take home messages from this chapter, our conclusions, looking at faculty experience in building a career that's based on community engaged learning is the following. One, nothing that you don't know, our, our own identities and our own values are integral to the work that we do. Very similar to what Bryant was saying. These identities, histories, and values direct the topics that we work on and our pedagogies. Also, again, as Andrea indicated, institutional support matters, right? Just saying this is part of the mission statement or we're all committed or using words and acronyms doesn't necessarily mean that we have the institutional support to do high quality community engaged work. So beyond mission statements, strategic plans and classification schemes, we need consistent resources and staff. And it has been, again, 24 years at the university, and I've been singing the same song, and we'll continue singing that song, because to just put it in a scheme, a reward, a recognition, a mission statement, does not manifest the infrastructure that's required to do high-quality community-engaged work. Our collaborations matter. Faculty who choose to do community-engaged work value interdisciplinarity over fiefdoms. Now, remember that the academic enterprise very much values 
publishing in a very, very specific tiny field repeatedly so that you can get lots of publications on the same topic. So we are, as the founders of the movement said, mavericks, boundary breakers, boundary spanners, because we are willing to discard those narrow delineations to move outside of our silos, work together and say, to some extent, I don't care what you call it. I don't care who owns it in a sense, right? We want to do good collaborative equitable work that brings to life the values of a community engaged pedagogy. But our disciplinary frameworks matter. We as academics see ourselves as at the cutting edge of our distinct disciplines. So we don't see ourselves, this kind of was a challenge in talking about this work. We may do community engaged work and not be education faculty, not be primarily grounded in the literature of student affairs or higher ed or education. And I've heard now repeatedly in 24 years, how frustrating that can be to community engaged professionals. Yet, we have a pedagogy and a research plan and community engaged scholarship that is solidly grounded in our own discipline. So we do believe that we are enacting, or in my field we say translating, the epistemologies, the pedagogies, the methodologies of our discipline by doing community action, community engaged work, and community-based research. So that's really important to keep in mind when you're working with faculty, is they probably know their own discipline really well, and they are moving beyond the confounds of their discipline to translate, expand, and, and document the value of this work within their discipline. Lastly, the rewards outside of academia matter greatly to faculty who do community engaged work. So, and Dr. Angie Mejia talks about how working with her community partners moves her beyond the nonsense and the noise of the academy. And she talks about, as I think we all do, how our collaborations with our community partners, and I can say in my case, it's with the military veteran community, have enriched our lives far beyond what we could have imagined. So I leave you with that. And thank you so much for inspiring me. Can you introduce Marie? Okay, I thought you were introducing Marie. Okay, Dr. Marie Sandy, I would absolutely love to hear your perspectives on this work. You are an expert and a boundary breaker yourself. Oh, thank you. I I um just wanted to say what a joy it was to be a part of this process, and um, just like the field um, continues with its you know with this, this emphasis on collaboration, I felt like it kind of expanded. Um, the network of people I was collaborating with through this. And um, I'm at an R1 institution at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And I, um, when I started this process, I was an associate professor in administrative leadership, but I have since taken on uh, the William Collins Kohler uh, Endowed Chair of Systems Change and Peace Building, where, thank you. And I, before I even applied for the job, I, was emailing and connecting with Elena Claw because I was trying to navigate this next um, phase of doing community engaged, um, you know, research and leadership on this campus. So um, I felt like the process of being a part of this book was part of how, you know, what our values are in the field of of service learning and community engagement. So. Um, Thank you for that, um, and Elena Kata for uh, inviting me to be a part of this chapter and, and connecting me to everyone. Um, and so that's been, and Piper, I just wanted to give you a shout out. Like I worked with you in, in California uh, years ago. And uh, so it's nice to see you know your face and to see so many um, people here. And it was just a really, I, I mean, I appreciate the multi-vocality of this um, entire book and that there are four people's stories that are featured. And for me, it was a great time, like, oh, what a long, strange trip this has been. And how did I engage in this work? And how did I come to this space where I am? And it was really an opportunity to me, for me to reflect on the values um, that um, brought me uh, to this work and, you know, some of the the, the the joy of doing this work and some of the challenges. Because um, as, as, as Elena 
uh, um, laid out in the beginning of the chapter, this is not new, right? It's been around for a long time and we know it works for supporting our students of, of color, first gen students. But even with that, the, the, the support for the faculty um, and staff doing this work is not not all the way there. Like they may, may have, I moved to Milwaukee, had never, my husband had never driven in snow before we moved to the upper Midwest. Um, I moved here because Elaine Kata gave me, here's the Milwaukee idea. Here's a book, which I read on the plane going to my job talk. And I'm all, I'm all there, Wisconsin idea, Milwaukee idea. And then sometimes, especially within the context of shrinking budgets at universities, um, the reality was, yes, you can do community engagement as long as you have the correct number of pubs that's going to get you promotion and tenure. Um, so I really appreciate um, that um, LEAD California is working on promotion and tenure um, activities. Um, so it's great. And, you know, it can be a long and winding path. I've gone through processes where I've had less resources and now I get to have money for, you know, to support students and community-based organizations. And I'm like embracing it and excited about it. And uh, thank you for um, helping me. I think part of doing this project and doing this part of uh, participating in this chapter gave me the courage to take the next steps. I'm like, do I really want to do this? And I'm like, yeah, heck yeah, I do want to do this. So thanks very much. Thanks, Marie. Um, I think everyone who's a part of, especially these two chapters, uh, could write a whole book themselves. <laughs> so we had to limit you to a small section of a chapter. Um, I'm really excited to introduce you to the next um, co-author of uh, the next chapter, um, Jamie Dukar. Um, we were really thrilled to have um, somebody who's uh, really, in my opinion, doing outstanding work at the university where she's at um, and balancing quite a lot of things, including leadership in the field as well. So uh, Jamie, I'm going to ask you to unmute and, and introduce yourself and your chapter uh, and as well. Thanks. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, I'm so, so excited to be uh, alongside of all these amazing co-authors. Um, so please, kudos to you, to Elena, uh, to Andrea. I know it was a tough road, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I fully acknowledge my role as one of your problem children, um, but thank you so much for giving me the opportunity um, to showcase uh, my work in this way. Uh, and I'll also represent the voice of my co-author, my colleague, uh, and my sister friend, Dr. Darren Ellerby, who couldn't be here today. Um, so, so one thing I'd like to name as, as we talk about uh, our chapter on relationships is that um, Darren and I have a really unique relationship in that um, we were both professionally raised outside of the context of higher ed. Um, so she came to the University of Pittsburgh from the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Pittsburgh. I came to the University of Pittsburgh after about a decade in working for community-based nonprofits and education consulting. Um, and we joined the university in 2017, um, really on very disparate sides of the house. And so um, at that time in 2017, the Community Engagement Center's model here in Pittsburgh was very emergent. And Darren was hired as our first Community Engagement Center director and had really started to think about what it meant to, um, to advance self-determination for a community that had been disinvested in over a period of decades here locally. I came to the University of Pittsburgh under the banner of community relations. And so when I came to Pitt, uh, really my role was thinking about how it is I could serve as um, a sounding board for our local residents, um, but also to think about uh, a risk management enterprise uh, that would minimize the amount of disinformation um, that was happening about what it is the university was doing and what it might be willing to do. 
Um, so Darren and I sort of took our positions back in 2017. Um, we really reflected on those as we started to write. Uh, we were in a doctoral program together. Um, shout out to the great eight. Uh, so there are eight of us that were the inaugural uh, Doctor of Education, uh, Urban Education Scholars here at Pitt. Um, we were thinking about what it means to be from outside of higher ed, uh, what it means to be Black women in the academy, uh, what it means to be doctoral scholars uh, and practitioners in the academy, and what it means to have a staff role that had large responsibility for how it is the institution shows up in our broader communities. Uh, and I hope that uh, the content of our chapter really helps to, to ground folks uh, in, in what that unique positionality is. And so for us, relationships are our bread and butter. And as was mentioned before, right, sometimes our community engagement enterprises in higher ed have really high aspirations and really emergent budgets and concrete resources attached to them uh, when they're new, right? And so um, one of the things that we were thinking about is how it is we were able to serve as brokers and how it is we were able to sort of shift our campus culture around engagement from one of uh, providing expertise outwards uh, to really thinking about how it is we could reposition our campus community as learners uh, because community engagement is not something uh, that is inherent to the academy. It isn't part of its natural routines and processes and policies. And so all of us have to do the work of unlearning what has been at our institutions and start to open up conversations that can be iterative and dialogic and inclusive of critical context and critical feedback in order to do better by our partners. And so Darren and I experienced that a lot together over five years in our office, uh, which was community and governmental relations, and then later became the Office of Engagement and Community Affairs as a decoupled standalone engagement office for our university. And through our different perspectives, mine very closely facing our campus community and Darren's very closely facing our external communities. Uh, one of the things that we worked on collaboratively was how is it that we can work with our faculty and our researchers to stand in the gap and with kindness and love show them the things that they don't know and the things that they, they don't think to address in their natural routines. Um, so you'll notice as we're talking about the work of the Homewood CEC, uh, and particularly a community-based participatory research project, is that we spend a lot of time investing in our grounded values, in our approaches, in our shared assets, because those are things that start to call folks to the table to reconsider what it is we do and why. Uh, and I think that's part of our special sauce here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so since we both started in 2017 until now, um, we've seen significant, significant changes around our institution. And we really believe that is because of the relationships that have been strengthened, expanded, deepened, not only within our academic enterprise here at the institution, but with key leadership external to the University of Pittsburgh that was starting to experience us showing up in a different way. Um, so just a couple of things that I wanna pull out from our chapter include um, one, listening to our communities and providing a, an accessible artifact to push back into our institutions has been key for both of us. So in Darren's role, she was able to work with a faculty person who had done this research project and really provided some guiding values that were community driven um, for folks to consider as they were either re-engaging in their community work or stepping into community work for the first time. My work in building inclusive internal communities of support and practice and skill building, again, reinforces this idea that we have a shared orientation and a shared 
value system that gives us a certain amount of trust to try and fail and try again. Um, so we do a lot of rapid pilots here, right? We do a lot of quietly testing the waters to see how folks think about certain approaches and certain language. Um, and we're really looking to work nationally on this. Um, so I can't help but to, but to notice that a few of my colleagues associated with the Place-Based Justice Network are here in the room. Uh, thank you for showing up. Um, I have to name that the Place-Based Justice Network has been incredibly critical for my own practice, my own sense of belonging and understanding of how it is I can position myself as an individual and a person within the academy, um, but that also we're capable of working together to make our work more expansive more grounded in humanity and the lived experience, and that we should not shy away from being able to recalibrate folks with decades of uh, wisdom within the academy as new learners, emergent learners, when it comes to connecting with our external communities. So that is my four minutes on the topic. Uh, again, I am so, so grateful to have been part of this publication and so grateful to be uh, with all of these other co-authors here. So I'll hand it back to you. Thanks so much. Um, I uh, The next um, chap is not necessarily a chapter, but um, I'm going to turn it over to Andrea to talk a little bit about chapter 12. So chapter 12 is a poem and we wanted to end this book with a sense of hope. And this poem was recited by the author at the um, swearing in of the first college core cohort. And there's just a small mention of the college core and it's very, it meant a lot. It's very inspirational. So I'll read you a, a snippet. Hopefully I do her justice. Do you want to go to college? At 10, they hope your answer is yes. See, she, day. At every age, they hope you continue to say yes, knowing that every Y-E-S, you will be blessed because both E and S is written in success, leaving out just the Y. Why? Because you will be the first in generations of the millionth generation to have a more accessible access to higher education written into fine print. So the poem is beautiful. I hope you read the book and can read the entire um, poem. And we, I'll, I believe, Elaine, we're going to turn it over to Elena to talk Actually, about. Uh, can I just it, ask a quick question? So that poem, was it written by Shandela Contreras? It yes. was written by her. And yes. Was she a student? Yes. She's a student at USC. Okay. Yeah, and she won um, Poet Laureate, I believe, of Los Angeles. Wonderful. Yeah, I think the one possible piece that's missing in our book is that we don't have the student voice. And so I was really th thrilled that 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 we included her um, with the poem. And I was because I was thinking she's the only we had. Well, uh, Ellen Middaw's chapter is co-authored by a student. OK, good to know. Thanks. I forgot about yeah, that. So we really, we really tried hard to get faculty, staff, administrators, community partners, and students all represented in the book. Thanks for reminding me of that. Um, I'm gonna, uh, uh, um, Elena, if you just have two minutes, only yes. two minutes to talk, and then I'm gonna uh, cover what uh, Dave would have covered at the end. Yes, and Shandela Contreras is the 2023 2023 California Youth Poet Laureate finalist and indeed was a student at USC. The other place student voices are represented is we provide the quotes from our college core fellows in the chapter in which we're talking about sort of the college core experiential learning experience. So to conclude, a wide range of topics have been addressed by the contributors including racial injustice, the marginalization of immigrant perspectives. Angie Mejia particularly talks about that in her section, violence and climate crises, which is the focus of Dr. Ellen Middow et al's work, which again is co-authored with a faculty and a student, 
we believe that the contributors have demonstrated the ways in which community education is central to the function of higher ed, which is to prepare a generation of learners to participate critically and effectively in a democratic society. We truly hope that our work has helped colleagues to continue to implement and institutionalize this pedagogy of hope and action despite the obstacles in our path. We believe it's worth it, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Um, Piper, if you could put up the slides. Um, I think that we don't have quite enough time to go through Dave, so let's just leave it there. Let's just leave it there. You don't have to advance to the others. I just wanted to point out to folks, if you want to go directly to to the book, you can put your uh, phone over the QR code and that'll take you to the page where you can buy the book uh, at, and I think right now you can get it at a 25% discount. So that's my little plug there. I do want to say uh, one thing um, that, you know, when we started the book, you know, things happen and you don't know where it's going to land. It took way longer than Elena and, and Andrea and I thought it was going to take. Um, and, and life happens. We had people finishing doctoral degrees. We had people having babies, multiple people having babies um, while they were trying to write the chapters for us. Um, we had career changes. Um, so, and we had life and death happening uh, around us. So I do want to say um, the book took us probably a year longer than we anticipated uh, because we we thought, you know, maybe we could get it done while Elena was on sabbatical. <laughs> but, um, and you just don't know what's going to happen in the world. And we asked David Donahue to write our foreword to the book. And unfortunately, he has laryngitis and cannot be with us today. Uh, he's not feeling well. So um, he provided a wonderful uh, foreword to our book. I'm really grateful. He's a colleague of mine from for many years and a also, also a, a multiple author of community engagement books uh, in the field. Um, and he really was able to help us see uh, and and possibly leaned us towards the title for our book, Reframing Community Engagement in Higher Education, because um, for him, he saw a lot of this as paradigm shifting. Also, the idea of hearing and situating our own experience into our chapters as a way to reframe higher education, which often asks us to not bring our full selves into the room, into the work. So um, I encourage you to read his um, forward. Um, I'm going to, we only have a few minutes left. So um, if you wanna take down the PowerPoint and we can open up to gallery view, is there anyone in the last seven minutes that we have uh, who wants to, I guess, raise your hand if you wanna ask a question of the, of the group? Um, and I do want to say, I I know some folks had to go, but I really deeply appreciate so many wonderful people that I recognize in the names on the screen um, who are in the field, who have mentored me, who are on this call. So um, please feel free to unmute or raise your hand if you have a question. And, and I'll open that to the other authors too, if there's something you really meant to say, forgot to say. And you can also- I just have a quick comment that it, it's just, it's beautiful to be part of a pedagogy of hope with all of you here uh, on this call. Um, so. Thanks, Marie. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge that I know our challenges change. That's the, you know, I didn't think I could finish it in one semester. Obviously, that's ridiculous. But four years was was indeed far more than what we had anticipated, truth be told. And what's remarkable is what challenges remain 
right? So for me, working against gun violence is a tremendous passion. And unfortunately, that's still a problem. And what challenges change in how student communities and ability to engage in discourse changes. So we are continually faced with some of the same challenge, and I would argue new challenges, but our need for infrastructure, resources, community, data, systemic ways of looking at student learning, um, ways to include more members of the academy, that remains. And so I, I do mean it that I hope that communities like this serve as a model for how we can continue to talk about how to get things done. So thank you all. So if there are no other, no questions, um, then I'm inclined to let everyone have a few minutes back of their day and time to possibly take a break before having to get on another Zoom. I'm gonna ask Elena, Andrea, Piper, if you can stay on for just a, a quick minute, but thank you all so much. You can stop the recording. Thank you all so much for being part of our 